introduce my guests this uh, hour. Um, with me, I have Sally Kaihu, who's the head of communications at the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and also Irene Wanjiku, who's the founder and CEO of Rexy. Rexy Roofing. Um, Karibuni Sana to the show. And we're going to be talking about women in manufacturing. And so these ladies are very, you know, up to the task, very able <laughs> to handle that discussion given what they do and where they work. But before we get there, I want to point your attention to just uh, something here. Um, India actually wants to track whatsapp messages india wants to track whatsapp messages and i would just be absolutely keen to hear what you guys think about it but here's some backstory india's plan to mandate the monitoring interception and tracing of messages on social media has alarmed users and privacy activists as well as the companies running the platforms prasanto k roy looks at um this is the author and he was looking at some of the the impact of that move um the country's information technology Technology Ministry will publish by January 2020 a new set of rules for intermediaries, platforms that allow people to send or share messages. It's a sweeping term which also includes e-commerce and many other types of apps and websites. Now, you guys, I'm sure, I'm sure you use WhatsApp. You know, you may not be on other social media, but almost everybody now, if they have a smartphone, is on WhatsApp. How comfortable would you guys be with the government sort of tracking your messages? Let's begin with you. Um, thanks so much. I think once the government starts tracking uh, messages, once they start tracking technology, there's no telling where it ends. It's kind of like you give somebody an inch and they take the entire ruler. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it, it, it's, it's very regressive, and I think it's time that governments start looking at coming up with progressive policies because technology is evolving every day. Mm -hmm. So we can't keep applying the same old regressive policies from yeah. yesteryears to technology that is constantly evolving. So okay. governments have to keep up and then look at ways to balance the privacy of the citizens vis-a-vis -vis the security of the nation. Mm. Yes. Irene, do you think there's any point at which this would be justified? Because let me give you some context as, to context as to why they are doing this. So it says that the move is in response to an explosion of fake news that has caused mob violence and even led to death. Um, there are frequent rumors about child kidnappers circulated on WhatsApp. And um, those messages with no basis caused mobs to lynch innocent passers by. Um, and those forwards, the government claims, you know, spread to tens of thousands within hours and become impossible to counter once they are have been spread. There have been more than 50 documented cases of mob violence triggered by misinformation spread over social media in India in the last two years. Does Understanding that, does that justify it at all for you in any way? Uh, I thank you so much. Uh, I think that there, there, there could be cases where these messages might need to be looked at or traced, but it can't be a blanket application because I think that's where we go wrong most of the time. Mm -hmm. Something is not working or an issue is going wrong. And so there are rules that need to be applied, but when the application comes, it is a blanket. Because this happened, it's going to be applied on everything. Mm. So there are instances that will be required, but I don't believe it's in everything because also we have uh, to look at freedom of speech and right. the uh, we have no we don't need to violate that right absolutely all right well we're gonna park that one there with my guests but you guys can continue sending in your feedback double two triple nine let me know would you be okay with the government tracking your whatsapp messages um, or maybe we should we give it a timeline should we say especially during elections do you think it would be warranted at that time because there's a lot of like hate speech and all sorts of ethnic slurs that go on would it be justified at that point for the government to be tracking uh, social media messages let me know double two triple nine is the sms line but moving on to another story here um this is actually from the papers as well the standard uh this is what page page 12 of the standard um it's about road safety um <laughs> so there's some roads that don't even have guardrails i'm sure you guys have seen mm -hmm. this simple mm -hmm. things like even when they're doing construction there's been a lot of expansion of roads and there won't even be 
you know, that cautionary tape. It's just a huge shimo in the middle of the road. Mm. And if you're driving or walking at night, mm. you could break your leg, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and uh, particularly in Mount Kenya, it is said that those are roads where every turn and bridge is a death trap. And I want to get this image on your screens uh, just shortly. Our team will be putting that up for you. But neglect by authorities and vandalism have left bridges without guardrails and road signs are non-existent. Let me show you an image, ladies. You can look to the screen mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, you can see there. That is the Saba Saba River Bridge in Maragua constituency along Muranga Nairobi Highway. Its guardrails have been vandalized, exposing road users to danger. Look at that. I mean, if anything was to happen and a vehicle had to swerve, he would completely topple over the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, completely. And on the left here is a vehicle that did just that. It is being pulled from the Rupingazi Bridge. You can see even those pedestrians are not safe. Should a stampede or anything break out, they would be toppling over as well. Mm -hmm. Crazy. <laughs> so no guardrails, no road signs, and um, then this also becomes a target. I mean, as far as insecurity is concerned, mm -hmm. lots of vandals then can take advantage of that. And um, the central region, Kenha manager Francis Kimata says that road infrastructure is now eerily becoming a casualty of the scrap metal industry, which is proving profitable for the vandals. Patrols by Kenha office officers are key in reducing the vandalism. Now, okay, so there's there's, a, there's several issues here. One mm -hmm. is that vandalism, mm -hmm. which <laughs> at some point you have to question, like, you know, how is it that our people... You know, we're at that level, right? That now we're even vandalizing metal from bridges, knowing full well that it could cost someone their life. Mm -hmm. um, that our poverty and lack of opportunity has gotten people to that point. Mm -hmm. But also, this bridge, especially this top one, that doesn't look like this just happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'd have expected, like, yes. surely you'd have yeah. done something. Or at yeah. least yeah. put, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know, yeah. There, sh there should have been something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you guys think? Am I being too harsh? <laughs> Yeah. There should have there been, should have been yeah. something. This yeah. looks like it's been like this for a very long yeah. time. True. It's True. a combination of negligence and corruption. And as you mm -hmm. say now, how poverty like is sprouts out of all of those sort of vices. Mm -hmm. So somebody just sat and thought, oh, well, they stole the bridge yeah. and didn't bother to go and yeah. check, you know, how can we how can we invest? How can we make stronger bridges? Sure. How can we secure the infrastructure that we put in? Absolutely. So you find that for the county, they're spending money on things that will keep being stolen. And then there's a guy who will just sit there and assume, you know, mm -hmm. five years later when there's an election, that's when I'll come and mm -hmm. start mm -hmm. making the road or making the bridge for you yeah. so that I can win points. And right. so there's a lot of there's a lot of vices meeting at that bridge there. sure <laughs> yeah sure and yeah. if i was to give my own analysis yeah. if you look at this second picture assuming even the car you know uh, crashed over where those pedestrians are literally hanging at the edge yes. look at that rail it, it also looks very old and mm. rusted mm. so there's also a question about you know how often are these things maintained yes. right mm -hmm. and do we even have like people go do we do mm -hmm. inspections mm -hmm. for a lot of these mm -hmm. things and why aren't those kind of built into our budget serene what would be your comments on this as we wind up i think yeah it's true that uh, it looks like the maintenance bit of it is is completely off and also we have to ask ourselves if it's an issue of vandalism who is buying because then you start punishing also from exactly. who is buying. Yeah. Um, because like now, you know, if you're caught, let's say with a stolen phone, there is going to be a penalty for you to pay. Yeah. So I feel that there's really a lot that needs to be done on the controls, on the vandalism, if you're caught buying. Yeah. Uh, because usually the people who are, may not be caught stealing, but you could be caught because we know where they're being used mm -hmm. and who is uh, taking advantage of this. Mm -hmm. And then maintenance, we need engineers. Sometimes you find that appointments are made, but the qualifications are completely 
actually missing. Right. So these are the things that I feel we should be looking at uh, if we want to reduce these kind of problems Absolutely. that we're having. So I think overall, yeah. it seems that there are opportunities that could be very well available in Kenya. It's, it's just this cutting corners, either mm -hmm. in how we study, how we learn, the qualifications that we mm -hmm. get. It's, mm -hmm. it's not helping any of us. Yeah, it's true. really not helping any of true, us. True. Anyway, you guys can send me your feedback on that. Double two, triple nine is the SMS line. Let's move on, though. Um, or at least let me introduce, because I know I need to go on break soon. Let me introduce our topic um, this hour for Viewpoint. Again, we want to talk about women in manufacturing. And just for some context, women make up over 50% of the population, provide 85% of labor in the agricultural sector, and women-owned businesses uh, make up about 48% of all SMEs, contributing about 20% to GDP. And that's a, that's a good number. Mm -hmm, I mean, that's mm -hmm. almost 50%. The world of manufacturing is beginning to realize the value of women's participation for its advancement, even transforming through technology and rapid digitization. But perhaps that's even a point to pause and ask for you guys' own mm -hmm. reflections. Mm -hmm. Do you guys, uh, agree that the world is beginning to recognize and appreciate women's participation in manufacturing? Perhaps recognize, yes, uh, because we've been talking about the lack of skills in this industry for a long time. And so the industry has realized that in order for the skills to then, or in order for us to have skills, we have to involve the 50% of the population, as you've talked about. Mm. So the recognition is there, but the structures and the tools and the institutions to then increase the participation of women in manufacturing, there's still a huge gap. Mm. So the recognition is there that we recognize yeah. that we need women. Right. However, how do we get them on the table? Right. That's a different conversation. Irene, as one who's running and uh, operating a business in this field, wh what are your sentiments about this? Do you agree that there's a level of recognition, but mm -hmm. not really that appreciation, and that there's still a lot of space that needs to be created or for women to barge through <laughs> yeah, yeah. within this industry? True, true. The, the recognition, yes, it's now there. And uh, the room is really big. It's, it's widening. There are so many opportunities. And we also have issues of... Um, breaking the, the society norms, yeah, and challenging those because those are also part of the hindrance of why we feel the appreciation is still missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to be talking about uh, women in manufacturing and looking about this uh, in a bit more depth. Um, you know, women are still being paid less than men for equal work. Is that the case as well in the manufacturing industry? What are some of the different challenges that women face in this industry, particularly as someone who is even trying to start a business in that field? These are some of the questions we're going to try and address when we come back from the short break. Stay tuned. This is Full Circle with Joyce. Alright guys, welcome back to the show and uh, shout out to you Prince Moon, uh, you're watching us from Eldoret Kidiwa and uh, Precious Emmy, uh, you say you're inside the circle, I love it. <laughs> uh, good morning to you too, Asante Sana for being a part of the show and uh, tuning in to Full Circle this morning, I do appreciate you. Remember you can continue sending in your feedback, double two, triple nine, I'll be looking out for your comments on Instagram on Facebook as well. Uh, Instagram, you can find us at Switch TV KE and on Facebook at Switch TV Kenya. And uh, I'm here with my guests, Sally and Irene, as we talk about women in manufacturing. Now, Sally, let's talk about the overall or the general position of women in, in the manufacturing industry in Kenya. Um, are they visible? Again, this is one of those fields that, you know, <laughs> a lot of times it's, yeah. it's, it's sort of been perceived that way. Yeah. Is that uh, the case though? Um, are they visible? They are starting to become visible. Uh, let's just say in the formal manufacturing employment, in the, sorry, formal employment in the manufacturing sector, uh, men are still taking up 72% mm. of that, that chunk. Uh, when we are talking about medium, small, uh, micro businesses, uh, women are about 35% okay. employed in formal 
SMEs. Yeah. So there's a visibility, it's just not as much as it could be. Mm -hmm. And you're right in saying that uh, women are relegated to, you know, to Ionikazi So even when you get into manufacturing, the expectation is that you start making yogurt in your house yeah. or you start making uh, house uh, hair products in your house or you just get into cottage industries and small businesses yeah. and you're kind of um, marooned mm -hmm. in those sort of boxes. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very hard to then see women going to steal manufacturing where the money really is at because mm -hmm. the country is spending a lot in infrastructure sure. development. Sure. So what percentage of women in this country are reaping from the investments of the government? Right. Uh, which women are in, in, in metal and steel and plastics and rubber and, yeah. you know, so, so all these big sectors that have the big investments and the big money, there's not so much representation of women. Okay. So you find a lot of women are actually, and I, and I don't know, maybe this is something that Irene will touch on, but I don't know if this is also part of a cultural thing, but also where's the mm -hmm. institutional support? Mm -hmm. Because you'll find that maybe the institutional and the policy supports, supports women to just grow from agricultural uh, based businesses into food sector in manufacturing because they're linked mm -hmm. and not farther than that. Mm -hmm. So where's the institutional support to prop women to go into cement manufacturing and, sure. and such? So so I think that the, the numbers are not looking too bad. They could be worse, <laughs> but we can't always do that. Mm -hmm. Like as a country, you can't always say, you know, we could have been worse. Mm -hmm. We have to mm -hmm. look at where the world is going and see how we can stay ahead of the curve. And I think putting women in the manufacturing sector and enabling them to be productive in that sector and to participate in that sector will put us ahead of the curve in a, towards achieving our economic goals as a country. All right, yes. all right. So yes. I think we'll, we'll come back to that question about culture, policy, institutional support. But first, let's, let's hear a bit from Irene. Um, and just a bit about your story. You are a founder and a CEO of a manufacturing company. So you started this when, 2011? 2011, yes, yes. What happened in your mind? Like, is this something you studied? Uh, not even really, because I had uh, I had been working in the construction industry, but doing the jobs that uh, I would say society expects that you're doing, you know, you're doing office jobs, not really out there. Okay. But and then I thought that, you know, this needed to change. And I remember one time I was listening to Tabitha Karanja, CEO of uh, Karachi uh, Breweries, and I had her saying that, you know, we shouldn't be confined in boxes. That is just for women, this is for men. So when I thought in uh, 2011, I said, you know, I can challenge this. Because so being you in went construction, from a desk job in yes. a construction company. Yes. Were you doing like what were you doing? Just uh, I was doing office work, personal assistant jobs. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so <laughs> this is how we're gonna role play this. <laughs> you literally woke up from doing like say an office assistant yes, or admin, yes. which is still valuable jobs. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Down. Sure, still sure. Great jobs, yeah. and we need them. But you woke up and said. Now I'm just going to take on the big guys and start my own company. Yes, wow. yes. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. Um, and now you are you founded uh, Rexy Roofing. Yes. Which you've done some massive projects. I think the first time I heard about you was uh, Caroline Motoko talking about you because this lady here is the one who roofed uh, the hub at Karen. Yes, we was did. that one Thank of your you. first contracts? Our first major contract, yes, it was. It, it really was, and it's. It, uh, and and I think this is where the the idea of you can think bigger and because the first instinct when we were told we would get the project i thought no but let me ask you about that because i, I feel like this is where a lot of young people and women particularly get stuck because yeah. literally you've come out of nowhere right True. and how do you then sort of build a portfolio or even present yourself in that meeting mm. that you get that level i mean the, the hub is not a small place it's true so how did you position yourself for them to even take you seriously and say, you know what, I'm going to give this woman a chance. Because I think that's a lot of where women and young people really struggle. It's even true. with just finding a regular job. I, I think that uh, sometimes we are afraid of fear, you know, and then you feel because I'm afraid I can't do it. And I thought for me, it's doing it afraid. Mm. 
I went for the first meeting. In fact, I remember when I went for the first meeting to discuss the hub, I almost ran out because I thought, no, something is wrong. Why should mm. I even be discussing this kind of a, of a project? Yeah. I said, you know what? I will sit through it. Okay. Yeah. So I, uh, the idea is you will be afraid and that's normal to fear some of these contracts or even some of these meetings, but you still do it and you sit through and you listen. Right. And uh, you say, yes, we will find a way to do it. Okay. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, that was Faith the mindset. Faith it till you make it. Yes. <laughs> okay. I like it. I like it. Um, but, you know, coming back to you, Sally, then, you know, one would always ask, because this is seemingly such a male dominated industry, at least for the moment, mm. you know, does that also then reflect in the uh, rewards or the, treat the treatment, the remuneration to women then in the industry? Does it sort of follow the fact that it is male dominated and so men are the ones who can etch out a proper living within this uh, industry? Maybe you can touch on that and, and how um, you can also encourage women to put aside that fear the same way that Irene did? I think, yes, uh, there is still largely, again, going back to the, because we can't separate the cultural and the institutional. Uh, culture always affects how institutions are then built sure. and then how they go ahead to either support or not support what the economy is doing. So they're very tight, they're very closely linked uh, mm. together. Mm. So um, I think I, I would, agree with with Irene is that a lot of women don't have the confidence um, to get into those offices mm -hmm. of course their confidence has been broken by a lot of things also mm -hmm. in the past mm -hmm. is the moment you get in guys are like ah you've come for this steel job mm -hmm. and you're a woman you know yeah. already mm -hmm. even maybe it's even the guy who's serving you tea True. Yeah, but yeah. already has looked down on you because you're a woman <laughs> hey, well, mm -hmm. you contract mm -hmm. and right. you're a woman mm -hmm. so already <laughs> that shuns already your confidence mm -hmm. and you're going into True. a meeting by the time you're getting there you're thinking I probably am not supposed to be sitting in the sure. city and I'm not supposed to be here but again as I said there's also what are the structures that we put in place to support women to do this thing sure because even when you're starting a business what we've discovered in the sector is that there's there's very little business development services mm -hmm. designed to support women in manufacturing specifically mm -hmm. very little mm -hmm. okay. very little services that can do that for you that can help you put together a business plan yeah. that can help your business know how to standardize productivity mm. okay. in terms of what is international, uh, internationally so, satis mm. certified. Yeah. Sure. So there are very, l there's very few businesses that can even help women businesses adapt to technology. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Irene then, um, following what Sally is talking about here, do you agree that there have been cultural policy, uh, institutional gaps. And mm -hmm. as you answer that, uh, just reflecting on your own experience, what are some of the different challenges that you, uh, as someone who's in there like literally every day yeah. now, um, have experienced uh, working in the manufacturing industry? It, it's true. It's true what Sally is saying. The, the cultural norms and how the society sees it, it's been very different and how we've even been brought up. The idea is that uh, women are better at uh, what you'd call social productive works. You know, you should be in hospitality because you are kinder, you are warmer, mm -hmm. but you could be all those things mm -hmm. and still be assertive. Sure. Yeah. So I, I think that uh, it's time that we, this has been a challenge. I mean, I remember there's a, a meeting I went for and somebody said, no, uh, probably you will con us. How can you, a woman, you're telling us you can take up this project. You will not just sell us product. You even have a team that's going to fix. We don't, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, because uh, somebody says, because I know an engineer who also does this work. He's the one who is going to do it. Wow. So uh, it's just because, you know, the idea was, it's not even do you have an offer face do you uh, where do you operate from where are the products from yeah it was just based on the idea that that you you alone. know yeah mm -hmm. yeah but here you are breaking ceilings <laughs> i mean you're going into steel now yes which has uh, <laughs> sally told us that's where the money is yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. but i mean so yeah. now you're also trying to transition your business into yes um deeper i mean i guess a deeper area of manufacturing mm -hmm. but um I want you ladies to talk to me as we get ready to wrap up though about how important is it for women to have that network and that you talked about mentorship yes. from Tabitha Karanja yes. there's also a women in manufacturing win WIM program uh, that 
uh, mm -hmm. CAM, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, runs. Mm -hmm. How important is that mentorship, that network, um, that collaboration, uh, rather than competition, particularly mm. among women mm. in manufacturing? How important is that? I'll take those as your final comments from both of you. I'll just say it's important to have uh, programs such as Women in Manufacturing creating network platforms because other than uh, linking women to markets, access to markets, and linking women to other businesses that will help them grow. Other than that, we create a space in the society for people to imagine women taking charge of this mm, sector. Right. So it's just creating, making it possible for that imagination to exist, sure. that women can run the sector, and we can actually take Kenya to the next level in terms of the economy because there's women in charge of steel sector, there's women in yeah. charge of metal. So Is it something that someone can just join or how do they take Yes, yeah, so when you come in, you, you can join as part of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. So WIM does not run as a mm -hmm. separate program. We are under the umbrella of Kenya Association of Manufacturers and we've even created an MSME hub okay. where micros can join Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Great. So it's not just for big companies. Great. And and we've made this uh, subscription fee, annual fees, very low, okay. even for micros. Okay. So if you're a woman and you're in micro, come. You can either join the hub or join through the Women in Manufacturing program. All right. And, and we, are, we are happy to welcome you. Excellent. Yes. Irene? Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. I, I think the biggest thing that we need, we are saying we need to change the norms, but you can't do it alone. So mm. first is to identify like-minded people like CAM. Uh, I, I remember when I joined Kenya Association of Manufacturers, it's because we were having a lot of problems. We had issues of power, we had issues of licensing. Mm. It was a struggle each and every day. And I wondered, what do I do? And I realized you need those kind of networks, people who are saying, okay, let's come together, let's put our efforts together, and then we can be able to deliver on these issues and have government even you know advocacy you can sure. do it alone you have an idea but you can take it to a bigger group with an idea when we go to women in manufacturing you find that a lot of women are doing manufacturing but at very low scale so yeah. we need to professionalize that how do you do that come offers even free programs mm. to train you so that you make your business is no longer a lifestyle business so it transforms to you grow becoming it. an employer yeah. and you can grow it and then together we break these barriers because it's true it's no longer about how independent can I be? Sure. It's how can we depend on each other so that we are able Come to on, move that's forward. That's a great line. Yeah. So all this indi individualism that we've been pushing for and our independence, Kumbi, it's actually working against it's us. It's wrong. We need to partner. Yes. We need to collaborate yes. 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 so that yes. we can grow. It's true. Ladies, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for your time. Congratulations to all you. of you for the great work you're doing. And uh, young women and young manufacturers out there, you've heard there's a program here. There's even some free course courses. So be sure to take uh, advantage of that by signing up. I'm sure they can just head over to your website. Yes, yes. Come over to www.com. Uh, Great. Yes. All right, guys, we're going to take a short break now as we get ready to transition into our second hour. We're going to be talking about health and wellness, specifically cervical cancer, as well as zoonotic diseases. If you don't know what that is, I'll be explaining that for you shortly. But uh, stay tuned. This is Full Circle with Joyce. See you at the top of the hour.